I know that everyone thinks that I'm just a hater. I am trying to keep an open mind, okay? You, you understand how much I love Avatar The Last Airbender, how much it means to me. I would love a good adaptation of this show. I'm rooting for good adaptations of the things I love. It's not my fault that people don't know how to deliver. You know that one TikTok sound that's like, brother, uh. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. Oh my god. <laughs> There's this one TikTok sound where this guy's just going like, ugh, brother, ugh. <laughs> no. That's me watching this whole show. <laughs> it's time to talk about the live action adaptation of Avatar, The Last Airbender. Last time you saw me, I was reacting to the trailer and reacting to some of the press releases that had come out about the show. But that was a few weeks before the show had been released. And now we are one week, I think almost to the day, post release of the new Netflix show. And I have so many thoughts, so many thoughts. So we're gonna dive in because this is gonna be a very long video, I can already tell. I have taken a lot of notes. Um, I've taken notes episode by episode. So basically we're gonna go through this covering all eight episodes and talking about every detail of every episode that I liked and disliked mostly disliked. I have my Appa sweater again, of course. I have Appa for emotional support and my emotional support drink, which today is some decaf coffee from Atlas Coffee Club, which is the sponsor for today's video. Atlas Coffee Club is a coffee subscription service that curates coffee from around the world that's ground to your preference and delivered freshly to your door. They source from over 50 different countries and each month you get to try out the coffee from a different country. Along with your coffee that you get each month, they also provide an info card about the country's history and the tasting notes of the specific coffee you get, as well as a postcard from the country. They have both whole bean and ground coffee and options for K-cup and Nespresso pods, so whatever your coffee preferences are, they have an option for you. They have really fair prices and you are also able to pause or skip or cancel your subscription at any time. I personally don't drink caffeinated coffee, but I love the flavor of coffee, so they also have a decaf option, which is what I chose. What I really like about Atlas Coffee Club is that they provide you with so much more information about the background of the coffee. It makes the experience of trying it out really fun and interesting. Personally, I really enjoy having a cup of coffee while I'm watching TV or a movie. I loved the flavor of this coffee and it was the perfect cup to have while watching my morning show. You can try out so many different flavors, so if it is a part of your routine, you'll never get bored. So if you'd like to try Atlas Coffee Club for yourself, you can get 50% off plus free shipping on your first month using the link in the description below. Again, thank you to Atlas Coffee for sponsoring today's video. Before we dive into every little detail of each episode, I do kind of just want to go over my overall thoughts, overview thoughts on the entire show. If you don't want to know the spoilers for the show, if you haven't seen it yet and you're just trying to decide if you want to watch it, you can stick around for this part of the video. I'm gonna be honest with you, I could be really, really mean about this and I I have been in my group chat with my friends, but I'm not, I'm not gonna do that here, okay? I'm not trying to insult anybody. I just want us to have higher standards. That's what I want. First things first, I think everyone's gonna ask about a comparison to the movie adaptation. And I wanna make this clear right off the bat. I don't think it's as bad as the movie adaptation. That movie adaptation is offensive on so many levels. Not that I don't think that there are parts of this that are also offensive, it's just differently offensive. I mean like Ong and Soka being their names in that adaptation and the fact that the entire cast except for the Fire Nation is white and you know, every other heinous crime that that movie committed, it's just all so bad. I would never say that this adaptation is as bad as the movie. That, however, does not make it good. It's not good by any means. In fact, it's terrible. I'm just gonna say this right off the bat because I think my thesis with this video just boils down to this. This live action adaptation of Avatar The Last Airbender is not good. People have just been conditioned to accept mediocrity and that is why people are trying to defend it. It's not a good show. It is by any standard not a good show, not a good adaptation, not even on its own. Even if it wasn't an adaptation, it's not good. It's not well made. It's poorly written. The CGI is not even very good. Everything about it feels incredibly rushed from the production design to the casting, to the acting, the script itself, the hair and makeup, all of it. It's just not well made. The only true compliment that I can give it is the fact that 
I think they, I guess two things. One, they tried with the casting. They tried to cast people who were similar to the characters, who looked similar to the characters, but they didn't give them a good script. They didn't give them anything to work off of. The only part of this that I actually genuinely enjoyed was the music. And that is only because it's the original soundtrack. It's adjusted a little bit for live action and they tweaked some things here and there, but it's the same music. So obviously, I'm gonna enjoy that. Apart from that, there was absolutely nothing about this I enjoyed. Actually, every single second of it made me wanna roll my eyes. And the worst thing about it, in my opinion, is the fact that it's boring. It quite literally took one of the most interesting, complex, in terms of both character and storyline, pieces of media that we have ever seen and dulled it down so much. It feels lifeless. It feels soulless. There's kind of nothing to this story. It's a skill, honestly, that you were able to strip this of any depth, any meaning, any life that the original story had. If I were the original creators, I too would have left this production. I too would want nothing to do with it. It feels offensive to the original to create an adaptation that feels this heartless. I walked away from this wishing that I didn't watch it. I didn't even want to watch the entire thing because I know people are going to ask me, if you hated it so much, why did you keep going? Simply because I wanted to make this video and because people were going to ask me about my opinions on it and I didn't want to just only watch half of it and not get the full picture. But otherwise, I truly, I was ready to quit at episode two. I was so bored and I knew it wasn't gonna get better. And I was right, in my opinion, it just gets progressively worse as the episodes go on. So many plot lines that they decided to cut from the show that I feel like are so essential to the later seasons of the show that if you don't have them in this season, it's not gonna make sense how we develop the characters or develop the plot later on. They stripped every single character of all of their personality, of their desires and their flaws. I think one of the major things about this was that none of the characters had any real flaws. Like they weren't allowed to be bad. Every character just felt like they only had insecurities and we were just like operating off of that and there was nothing else to them. It was so unbelievably dull and it did such a disservice to one of the greatest cast of characters I think we might have ever seen. It's kind of ridiculous to me that a show that was given a budget that is this high was able to do so little with it. Like they wasted all of that money on just some of the CGI like shots that we got of Omashu and the Northern Air Temple or the Southern Air Temple. And that was basically where they spent all their money. There was absolutely no money put into the writing of this show, the costuming, the hair and makeup, the script, like absolutely no time, no effort was put into any other element of this show. And it's astounding that you're gonna take something that's this beloved, this well known. You already have a failed adaptation. You could have just tried a little bit more. The other thing too is that this show stripped all of the humor out of the original and a huge component of Avatar is that it's funny. They balance humor and uh, philosophical subjects and trauma and like really like dark things so well in a children's show that it feels so approachable for both children and adults. The thing with this one is that it felt like it was made for an even younger audience than the original because it talks down to you half the time. So much of the dialogue is just expository. They're constantly talking down to you because you have no idea what's going on. So they have to explain everything to you. And it feels awful to watch narratively and from a writing standpoint, that's just a really weak way of telling a story too. There are just so many choices that they made that were Oh, horrible. <laughs> I hope this is the end. I hope that they don't keep trying to make adaptations like this. I just find it so deeply insulting to animation as an art form. We just don't need live action adaptations of some things and there's absolutely no point in it. It's just people wanting to make money and that's what this felt like. So much of this felt like it was like written by AI or edited by AI. It was ridiculous. There was no heart and soul, like I said, put into this at all. And I know that the creators of this were saying that they really cared about it. It doesn't feel like they cared about it. It honestly doesn't even feel like they watched the original. With some of the things that they missed, the points of the story, the morals of the story that they missed, it feels like they did not watch this original show. It feels like they've just spent their time reading fan fiction about this show or maybe watching the movie adaptation and going off of that. This does not feel like it was made by people who truly, really and truly have a passion and a love for both writing and creating and for this story specifically. And the thing that I kept saying as I was watching it the entire time was that this felt like a school play. That was the level the quality of it. So yeah, those are my overall thoughts. <laughs> if you were wondering if you should watch it based on my recommendation, 
I say no. Quite honestly, I just think it's deeply boring and it's just gonna waste your time. Go back and watch the original. It's still there, it's still just as good as, as it's always been, and it's worth every rewatch. I honestly, like I said, wish that I could unwatch it. <laughs> I wish that um, Netflix hadn't gotten my watch from this so that they wouldn't think that more people want this, because I don't want more of this. I absolutely do not. But that pretty much wraps it up for my overall thoughts. So now let's get into my detailed thoughts from every single episode. So if you don't want any kind of spoilers, if you want to watch it and you have not seen the original, first of all, just go watch the original. Go watch the original, do yourself a favor. If you want to watch it without watching because you want to save yourself some time, we're gonna, we're gonna cover everything. So let's get started. So first things first, I want to start off with how the show starts off, which is a scene that we don't have in the original. It starts off with this scene of this earthbender running through the Fire Nation streets and some Fire Nation soldiers chasing him down. He hands this scroll to the other earthbender who is with him and he says they're going to attack the Earth Kingdom. That guy rides off, the Fire Nation soldiers capture the earthbender. They take him to Sozin. So we are back in Sozin's time. We basically start off in the past in this show. He's talking to Sozin and then he's like, wait, you you wanted me to give that scroll to my friend so that we'd all think that you're attacking the Earth Kingdom, but you're not attacking the Earth Kingdom, are you? And he's like, no, I have my sights set higher, much higher. You, you wanted us to know we aren't the real target. My sights are set higher, much higher. I hated the fact that we started with that scene because the original show starts with Sokka and Katara finding Aang because what does the original story do? Center these children who are fighting back against this oppressive imperialist country because that's the point of the story. We are centering these kids. We are centering their story and their struggle and their fight. But in this story, right off the bat, we now understand who we are centering the Fire Nation. That is what they wanted to do. And I think that's what they kind of maintain throughout the entire story. It really sets the tone for us for where this show is going to go. And when they made that Game of Thrones comparison, I think that's what they meant. Focus on the villain more so than the kids fighting back against the oppressive regime. Then from there, we cut into the intro. The intro that was not the intro. I don't know why, at the very least, you wouldn't keep in the iconic intro from this show and change it up. First of all, they don't even make Katara narrate it. What was the point in that? What was the point in having Kyoshi narrate that? By the way, the actress for Kyoshi was not a good actor either, so her voice acting for that intro was not good. There's a reason Katara narrates it, um, because she's, first of all, one of the most important characters in the story, and second of all, it just, it adds so much. I don't need to explain all of that. There was no reason to cut it. Second of all, why did you change the intro? Why does it say something else? Why is it like, for, for millennia? millennia. Blah, 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 blah. What, what was the reason for that? The visuals for it were ugly. Like, they were just flat out ugly. It looked bad. I don't understand how you could miss the mark so much. It, it's right there. And then they have Grand Grand say it later on in the episode with just like no emotion. Water, earth, fire, air. Long ago, the four nations lived together in harmony. Then everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. And then we never hear it again. I don't think anybody is happy about that. Even the people who ended up liking the show, I don't think anyone's happy about that intro. This is also super nitpicky, but like the title card looked horrible. Why did you choose such an ugly font with such an ugly animation? So at this point, we are literally, and I wrote this down, six minutes into the show. We've just gotten that first scene and in the intro and I'm already like, I hate this. I wanna quit, I don't wanna be here. I'm still gonna keep going because it's only episode one, I need to see where it goes. And I know that everyone thinks that I'm just a hater. I am trying to keep an open mind. Okay, you you understand how much I love Avatar The Last Airbender, how much it means to me. I would love a good adaptation of this show. I'm rooting for good adaptations of the things I love. It's not my fault that people don't know how to deliver. Anyway, I'm just not having a good time up until this point. Then we cut to Aang and the Air Nomads, and then Aang starts flying. <laughs> 
I know a lot of people are up in arms about whether or not he's flying or if he's just kind of gliding down. I don't really think he's Zaheer flying. I did think that in the very first scene, but later on you can kind of tell that's just how they're animating him gliding around. Regardless of what's going on, it looks corny as fuck. Like it just looks really bad. I don't know why he's doing like all his little twirls. I saw a tweet that was like, I thought he was gonna break out into song. Me too. I really thought we were getting like a musical all of a sudden, which in all seriousness, I think that might have been better. I think it would have made more sense for the tone that this show was going with. Then we move on into Aang finding out that he's the Avatar um, about like five hours before he decides to run away. There were so many things about this change of them telling Aang that he's the Avatar in that moment that really bothered me because first of all, the reason Aang runs away is because the fact that they want to send him away is his final straw. He has already been treated differently by the kids. They don't want to play with him anymore because they think it's unfair, so he's dealing with that. Monk Yatsa's kind of become his only friend. The other monks don't treat him the same anymore either. He's tired of people treating him differently. He's tired of being seen as different and seen as like this person who's supposed to hold all this responsibility. And now they're saying they're going to send him away from the one person that he feels like is his only remaining friend, the only person who still treats him the same and he's afraid. So it's all of that built up on top of each other that makes him end up running away. He's known for a little bit at least now that he's the Avatar. But in this version, he just found out like maybe five hours ago and then he goes to sleep. All of this is on his mind. He walks out, he monologues to Appa, who by the way, wasn't a fan of that CGI. He looked scary. He monologues to Appa about how he doesn't want the responsibility of being the Avatar. And then he's like, let's just go up to where things make more sense. And he literally just goes for a ride on Appa. He doesn't even run away. He's not even avoiding his responsibilities, but then the rest of the series, every adult he encounters starts yelling at him for how he's a coward and how he ran away, when in this version, he didn't even run away. What? At least stick to your own narrative, okay? Because that makes no sense. I was also so irritated by the fact that that monologue was given to Appa. It was ridiculous because in the original version that gets played out in the episode The Storm. That is probably one of the best episodes in season one and just one of the best episodes of the show in my opinion because that's when we get both Aang's backstory and Zuko's backstory paralleled with each other, which I think is just such genius writing in that original show. And we see Aang run away during this other storm and then Katara goes and finds him and then he confesses to her that he ran away. We don't know up until that point and that's like, I don't know, maybe like 10 or so episodes into the original series. So up until that point, we don't even know that Aang ran away. We don't really know what happened, but we don't see the seriousness, the serious toll that it's taken on him and the guilt that he's holding all the time. And so when we get that reveal and his confession to Katara, it's a real emotional moment. But in this version, you don't have any of that. Aang just found out he's the Avatar a few hours ago, and now he's kind of just grappling with it. And then he just gets stuck in the storm, gets into his Avatar state, creates the iceberg, and that's that. We don't get the build up to that reveal. We don't get Aang's emotional arc. We don't get any character development whatsoever. And it's just so unbelievably boring to tell the story in that way. This is like a common theme, I think, throughout the entire series. They just kind of tell you a lot of things. They don't show you anything. They just tell you everything through exposition. And it's so boring. That's what makes it so unwatchable. Then we get into Katara and Sokka finding Aang in the iceberg and everything. And here is where I have a lot to say. You've been thinking, Hannah, you've had a lot to say about everything. Yes, I have a lot to say about absolutely everything, but this is one of the things that pissed me off more than absolutely everything else. Because what do you mean you cut out the reason that Katara frees Aang from the iceberg and changed it to be completely meaningless? What did I say in the video that I made uh, reacting to the trailer and all the press releases? I said that if they cut out Sokka's sexism and they cut out the scene where Katara breaks Aang out of the iceberg because she's yelling at her brother for being sexist, the show is gonna lose and she as a character is gonna lose so much of its depth and meaning and everything. And what did they do? cut all that out. They cut all of it out. In the original version that we all know and love, Sokka and Katara are fishing. Katara catches a fish with her water bending. Sokka ruins that and then blames her and says, leave it to a girl to ruin everything, something along those lines. And then she starts yelling at him. And then because she's angry and like water bending behind her unintentionally because of the emotion that she is feeling, she accidentally breaks the iceberg that frees Aang. As we all know, iconic moment. It gives us so much insight into her as a character and the power that she has. And it's hilarious. And it's making a commentary on this show's stance on sexism, specifically. In this version, Sokka and Katara are just 
fishing. There's just like a current that drives them off course and then they fall, their boat starts floating away and then Katara looks behind her and she's like, what's that? They just stumble upon the iceberg. Katara tries to bend the boat closer to them, the boat that is in front of her by the way, the boat that's in front of her and the iceberg that's directly behind her, she is bending in front of herself and not in the way that in the original show she's like moving her arms back and causing the water to move behind her. No, she is just bending straight in front of her trying to move this boat forward and somehow that causes the iceberg behind her to completely crack open and break and Aang to be set free. Now you tell me, you tell me which version of that has more depth, has more meaning, is better written. Okay, because one version means absolutely nothing. It gives us nothing about Katara's character. It doesn't show us her power. It doesn't show us the dynamic between this brother and sister. It doesn't give us the show's moral stance at all, but in the opening scene of the original show, we get the show's moral stance, specifically on its views on misogyny and sexism. In this one, we get nothing. We get nothing from Sokka. He hasn't been funny this entire time. Every single joke that they have tried to make doesn't land because it's poorly written and poorly delivered. He's not a good actor. I'm very sorry. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about these kids acting. I will just say flat out across the board, not one person in this show except for Ozai and a little bit of Jet are good actors. Nobody is good. A lot of the kids, I don't even blame them because they're kids and they haven't been given a good script or a good director to help them, to help them improve with any of this. There's just, they're working with nothing. And then the other actors, they also are really working with nothing, but nobody's good. Everyone is in fact pretty bad. So it's really unwatchable in terms of the acting. So the jokes don't land. Sokka's not funny. He has no personality. Katara feels meek and really, really weak. She has no strength to her. She has no emotion, no anger in her. She's not funny either. There's nothing to her. I just, I don't understand how you took such a lively, well-written, strong, incredible character and stripped her of everything. Everything. She feels kind of pointless in this story. There's really no reason for her to be there. She doesn't really do anything. And that's so astounding to say because she's Katara. She's like the driving force of this. She's the heart of Team Avatar. But she doesn't do anything. And it's just, oh my god, it makes me so upset. Sokka, completely lifeless. Aang, completely lifeless. They keep telling you that he's like goofy and fun. He's never goofy in the entire show. And there's just nothing going on there. They wrote them so poorly. They wrote them so devoid of any character, of any emotion, of any flaws, anything. There's just nothing to them. They're shells of who they're supposed to be. Anyway, as we go on in this episode, it just gets progressively worse in terms of the acting and the writing of it. It's a lot of expository dialogue, which makes the pacing of the show feel absolutely awful and just tedious to get through. Sokka continues to be completely unfunny. Katara continues to give us absolutely nothing. Aang has no riz. Um, there's no Aang-Katara romance in the entire show. Like, there's absolutely none of it, which is astounding because um, we have to have that because if we don't have that, what on earth is going to be Aang's earthly attachment that keeps him from entering the Avatar state in book three because Katara is the reason he ends up blocking that chakra and that he can't go into the Avatar state later on. I understand that they could add it in later, but there's a reason that her face is the first thing that he sees when he wakes up from the iceberg but that doesn't even happen in this version. She's not the first thing that he sees. And there's absolutely none of their romance whatsoever, none of their relationship, which is a, a choice. <laughs> Maybe a little bit more nitpicky, but this genuinely really bothered me. There is no yip yip in this show. I think they say yip yip one time and it's like, I don't know, somewhere in the middle of the season or something like that. I watched that and I was like, so if he's not saying yip yip now, that means we're not getting the iconic yip yip that he says with Yue later on. And I was right we don't. And then at the end of this episode, we get to Aang finding Monkey Yatso's body, which, oh, I completely forgot to talk about the genocide of the air nomads. That was a whole thing. I've already talked about most of my feelings in the previous video about why I think that's completely inessential and why I think that so many action movies and like TV shows and stuff that they make feel the need to focus on showing us violence because they think that we can't empathize with people if we don't watch them be killed. There's so much to say about that. And I talked about it, like I said, in that video, but it was so inessential. Like it was just completely inessential. I didn't feel more watching that happen. I just felt like we were wasting time that we could be dedicating to actual 
actual plot lines that were in the original show that we cut out for absolutely no reason, just to show some more violence, just to show off the fighting sequences that they decided to choreograph and some of their visual effects skills. Like, I, I didn't care. It wasn't even impressive. Like, the fighting wasn't even that impressive. It didn't look so good that we should have kept it in there. It was mid. It was so mediocre. But then later, at the end of this episode, when Aang finds Monkey Yatso's body, no emotional payoff there. When you see it in the original show, when Aang goes to the air temple and he sees Monkey Yatso's skeleton there, you feel his pain with him because you are discovering this with him. But this way, we as the audience already know what happened. And since we already know what happened, we don't feel it the same way. In the original, we feel it alongside the character. That's what makes it so powerful. I just think it's such lazy writing, again, which is a huge theme throughout this entire show, such lazy writing from start to finish, and it does such a disservice to the original story and the original characters. The other thing about that scene that I specifically hated was in the original, Katara's the one who talks him down, who talks him out of that, who helps him. It's hearing her voice that helps him calm down and get out of the Avatar state in that moment. But in this version, Katara doesn't say anything because again she's not essential to this story she's pretty useless actually because they've made her useless the reason Aang comes out of the avatar state is because he just remembers some things that monkey Yatso said to him and then he calms himself down which is so different and again cuts out so much of Katara's character and her relationship with Aang too that we're just not establishing and why what is the reason for that it's just so deeply ironic that they went into this show saying we want to make a version that is less sexist than the original, which was not sexist at all, mind you, it wasn't. They just don't have reading comprehension. And instead, they took all of the agency, all of the well-written parts out of every single female character in this show, they stripped them of all of that, and they ended up making something that was 10 times more sexist and misogynistic than the original show ever was. And that's why it pisses me off whenever they're like, oh, we're cutting the sexism, we're cutting this. You, you, I just cannot believe that you people don't know how to read, that you people just do not have reading comprehension. You'd have to be reading that wrong on purpose. Or you just fundamentally do not understand that depicting something and condoning something are two completely different things. Wow. Now we move on to episode two. I think episodes one and two were the ones that I had the most written about. And then after that, I was getting so tired. I took a lot less notes. But the main thing I got to talk about in episode two is Sokka and Suki. Speaking of adding in sexism when trying to remove some of the original sexism. So in the original version of the Kyoshi Warriors episode, we go to Kyoshi specifically because Aang is trying to avoid his feelings and his responsibility. And he just wants to play around and have fun because he is a kid and he is actually goofy. In this version, they literally just go to Kyoshi Island because Aang steals Zuko's notebook, like his diary where he has all this information about past avatars. And that is how Aang learns about the avatars, not even from Roku, because Roku's only in one scene of this entire show, which we'll get to later. He doesn't learn about anything about the avatars from the past avatars. He learns about them through Zuko's diary, which is crazy. <laughs> so they go to Kyoshi Island because he wants to learn more about the avatar state that he doesn't even know is called the avatar state yet. I don't know why we're incorporating season two plots into season one. It doesn't really make sense why he's so worried about the avatar state because he's like, I don't want to hurt anyone. When at this point in time, he has literally only gone into the avatar state two times because they cut out the third time that he goes into the Avatar state, or the second time, I guess, when he's escaping from Zuko's ship, they cut that out. He doesn't actually go into the Avatar state then to protect them. He's only been in the Avatar state the first time when he created the iceberg a hundred years ago, and when he got upset over seeing Monkey Yatso's body. But for some reason, he's like, the Avatar state is so dangerous. I have to be able to control it. I'm like, my guy, you've been in the Avatar state twice and you've done literally like no damage whatsoever. I don't know what the concern is here, but anyway, that's not even the biggest problem. That's why we go to Kyoshi Island. This time they get there, they do get captured by the Kyoshi warriors. There's none of the original lines from the original episode. There's no Sokka saying like, where are the men who ambushed us? And then she's like, we're the people who ambushed you. And then he's like, we got ambushed by a bunch of girls, blah, blah, blah. None of that happens. None of it happens. They just get captured. Suki's mom is there for some reason. I know some people were happy about that change. I don't really see why she had to be there. There was no reason for any of that other than to add in the element of like Suki hasn't been away from Kyoshi Island ever and she feels trapped here and blah 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 to add to the sexism that they're gonna add into the show which we'll get to. So none of their original dynamic is in it whatsoever. She literally just is kind of into him and he's kind of into her 
I think just because they find each other good looking and that's it. That's what their entire relationship is based off of. And he's just stumbling over his words. So how are you protecting your people if you're here? What? I'm not. I mean, I, I am. I, I mean, I may not physically be there. Sorry, how does it go again? I'm protecting Aang, so I'm protecting the village. He's being like really embarrassing and Suki says something to him that's supposed to be like a comeback where she's like, I'm actually an elite warrior who was trained in the image of Avatar Kyoshi. So I'm not just a warrior, I'm a Kyoshi warrior. Before she died, Avatar Kyoshi trained an elite force in her image. That is why I'm not just a warrior, I'm a Kyoshi warrior. And it's supposed to be like a burn or something, but she literally doesn't even say anything meaningful whatsoever. Then later on, Sokka and Suki are talking again and about what? Absolutely nothing. Then she just like starts teaching him how to fight for no reason. He doesn't even wear the Kyoshi Warrior costume or wear the makeup. They even make her take off the makeup at a certain point, which was ridiculous. And their entire dynamic kind of hinges on the fact that Suki just keeps reminding him that he is still in fact a big strong man. And then she ends up thanking him. Thank you, Sokka. For what? For bringing the world to me because her whole thing is that like, she's been stuck on Kyoshi Island and she hasn't really gotten to see the world. So she thanks him for bringing the world to her. So she's the one who learns a lesson from him instead of the other way around. Whereas in the original, Sokka literally has to be humbled. He comes and humbly begs on his knees, literally, for her to teach him how to fight because he realizes that he shouldn't have been treating her that way because it was wrong to judge a girl to say that she can't fight just as well as a man can fight. He has to learn that lesson. Then at the very end when they're leaving, the last conversation they have in the original show, he says, I'm sorry, I treated you like a girl when I should have treated you like a woman. Warrior. And then she kisses him on the cheek and says, I am a warrior, but I'm also a girl. He learns such a big lesson in that moment. And in this version, she's the one thanking him for teaching her a lesson. A lesson he also never teaches her, by the way. He doesn't actually do anything. They just say that. Sokka quite literally does nothing in this episode. They just feel like his presence somehow broadened her horizons and changed her life completely when nothing actively happened in the episode. And you want to tell me that the original version was sexist and misogynistic and this version isn't? That's actual sexism. What did I say in my original? I'm literally just repeating myself from my last video. Everything I predicted that they would do wrong in this, they did. That's actual sexism. The fact that you have made that narrative about him and making him feel good and Suki reminding him that he is big and strong instead of Sokka learning that she's just as strong and powerful as he is and having to be humbled. He's literally humbled and he's not in this version. Not at all. He has no lesson to learn because he has no flaws. So everything is just so boring and so dull. And the female characters, lifeless, soulless, meaningless to the story, honestly, and just there as props for the male characters, like every other show we've ever seen. Which was so different from the original Avatar The Last Airbender. Its female characters were well-written, fleshed out, real people, complex emotions, and they were strong. Strong in every sense of the word and none of them are in this version, none of them. There were a lot more elements to this episode too that I found like completely ridiculous. I don't understand why they added in the element of you can only talk to that past avatar if you're in their temple. The whole point of being the avatar and having that spiritual connection is that you can always talk to your past lives. We learned that this was an issue in Legend of Korra, which I won't spoil if you haven't seen that, but like we learned that that was like a thing that becomes a serious problem later on. So why did you add in the element of like, oh, you can really only communicate with them when you're in their temple? Why? Literally, why? <laughs> why are we changing the lore here? Why is Kiyoshi possessing him? Why is this grown woman lecturing him about how he's a coward? And how many have already been hurt because you haven't been here? Run away from your responsibilities again, and even more will be hurt. Being the Avatar means putting your duties above all else, even your life. This is something that I felt for a lot of the characters, um, specifically with her, with Iroh, who we'll talk more about him as an actor in a bit too, with Zhao. I think they're probably the three main ones that I feel this way with. The way they speak, the cadence of their speech, it feels too modern for this show. I think Ozai's actor does a good job of not doing this. He feels like he fits into the time, into the world of this, but those actors sound too modern. What I specifically wrote down for Zhao's character is that he sounds like he works in a cubicle five days a week. Such a lovely island. 
You won't mind if we take a look ourselves. He also sounds like a Disney villain, like a Pixar villain to me. Something about the way that he talks, it's just, it sounds ridiculous. Every time he starts talking, I cannot take him seriously. Nothing about him is intimidating in the slightest. And every time he speaks, I'm like, that man sounds like he works in an office. And that's how I also felt about Kiyoshi's actor. You could like feel all of them acting. That was the other thing. Like I could tell when she took a breath, the director was like, okay, take a breath in this moment. Like it felt so scripted. Even your life. I was like you once. It really felt like this entire show felt like, like I said, a school play where they just handed the script out a few days before and they had just finished learning all their lines. So they've just been getting the hang of things and they've just barely memorized their lines. So you can really feel everybody acting, which is not a good sign. It feels like a bunch of people in cosplay playing out like a, a, a school play. It literally feels like the Ember Island players. Like how deeply ironic is it that this show literally has an episode parodying itself in a like poor adaptation of itself. And then they make this terrible adaptation. Like, come on, come on. You could have made the Ember Island players and I would have had a better time watching that. I'm so serious. Moving on to episode three. This one I have the fewest notes for, mostly just because I was so done at this point. But we, we do still have a lot to cover, unfortunately. <laughs> so this is the episode where we're introduced to Azula. There's a lot to say about her. First and foremost, I think the most important thing, I don't think the writers understand who Azula is. Also based on some of the stuff I've seen online, I don't think a lot of the audience understands who Azula is. A lot of people are talking about how they're really happy that they're actually showing some of the abuse that Azula also faced, as if the original show didn't give us any of that, except that it did it subtly and later on after we already knew her a little bit because it's well written. In this version, Azula is not Azula. Azula is just a little girl who is trying to prove herself to her dad in the most basic way you could possibly write that. Whereas in the original, Azula is crazy. She is unwell for a number of reasons. Yes, she is a kid, but she's doing bad, bad things. And the show never tries to justify her actions. They do try and make you understand her and empathize with her in some ways, but they don't try and justify what she does. I feel like in this version, they want to justify some of her behavior because they're showing her to us in a really sympathetic light from the very beginning. All we get about Azula is that she is constantly trying to prove herself to Ozai, who's putting her through it all the time, who's comparing her to Zuko all the time, and she always feels like she needs to prove herself to be better than Zuko. I feel like they fundamentally misunderstand the purpose of her and the dynamic of her relationship with Zuko and with her father. Azula is the prodigy child, okay? She's naturally good at everything. She does try. It's not like she doesn't try to be who she is, but she's obsessed with perfection. She has to be perfect at all times, but she never lets anyone see under that mask. It never slips away, right? Like the first time we're introduced to her in book two and that one strand of hair just slips out of her hair, she like pushes it back immediately and she's upset with herself because it's not perfect. We don't get any of that. She's just kind of like an irritated young girl who's upset that her dad doesn't take her seriously, but in the most teen angsty way, not in the way that Azula is. She just feels like a kid. She just feels like some kid. She's not Azula. She's not intimidating. She's not scary. We should be afraid of her. We should be intimidated by her. And I'm not, not in the slightest. Also, the other thing with her and Mei and Tai Lee, every scene they have is so unbelievably stagnant. It is just three people standing around talking every single time. That's another thing that also makes it feel like a school play. It's so boring. Mei and Tai Lee, no personality not a shred of personality. They're just two other girls standing there talking to the third girl, Azula. None of them are really distinctive from each other and they've been given no personality. What are they supposed to do? All they've been told to do is just stand there and like deliver these lines. They told the actress who plays me, I promise you, they just told her to talk slowly. And that's what she did. And that's what we get. It's so awful. <laughs> and again, I'm not even blaming these kids. It's not the kids fault. It's the fact that they don't have a good director and they don't have a good writer and they have nothing to go off of. Other things I wrote down about episode three Omashu, there is no Zhao and Zuko Agni Kai, which really upset me. It's so embarrassing for Zhao and it adds like another layer to our understanding of who both Zuko is and who Zhao is and why he takes this so personally. So none of that was there. We literally cut out an actually interesting, fun fight scene that's in the original show to add in 
unnecessary fight scenes that are not in the original show or extend certain fight scenes for no reason whatsoever. Why are we cutting out the actual fight scenes we do get that are super essential to the narrative of the story that add to the story to add in things that we literally don't need? Like you had it right there. Uh, I can't, I can't, I'm getting so frustrated. <laughs> The other thing about this episode I hated was that we added um, Teo and his father into this episode. That episode where we meet Teo and we get to see what his father and the rest of the refugees are doing living in the air temple and Aang feeling this grief about the air temple that he used to remember being destroyed by this industrialization essentially. There's so much philosophical commentary in that episode, okay? It's one of my favorite episodes in the entire show. The fact that we just cut all of that out, put Teo and his father in Omashi and just had them be there for no reason. They didn't need to be in this. They really didn't need to be. You could have just cut the whole episode out at that point if this is what you were gonna do with it. There's none of the grief that Aang feels of seeing his people's land destroyed in that way, but then also understanding that these people are also refugees who have been displaced by the Fire Nation. He doesn't grapple with any of that. There's none of that grief of seeing these people flying like airbenders and realizing they're not airbenders at all. All we get is one line saying, you're not an airbender and that's it. We don't get any more of it. But that episode is such a pivotal moment for Aang. It's so important to his character and it's all cut. And then another thing that they cut too that really pissed me off, the episode where Aang learns to firebend for the first time and Master Zhang Zhang, like that's just all cut out as well. So then what's gonna happen come the time where Aang has to learn how to firebend and he doesn't have any fear of firebending? Because the reason that firebending is so difficult for him and he thinks that he can become the avatar without ever learning how to firebend is because he burns Katara and he's so afraid of hurting her or someone else again that he literally prevents himself from firebending. So we're cutting all of that out too, and it's just heartbreaking because it's so essential to his character and the narrative of the story later on. This is also where we meet Jet in Omashu, and this is the one thing that I thought, in terms of like, the look of the freedom fighters, I was not upset. I feel like they kind of worked, they felt like the freedom fighters, however, they were kind of pointless overall. <laughs> there really wasn't much of a reason for them to be in it either. You Again, you probably could have just cut this too at this point. I mean, I love that episode. I think it's essential, but in the way they decided to go about it, it felt really pointless. Sokka and Aang, they technically meet Jet, but they don't meet Jet Jet. They just see him as like a different character because his introduction is different than in the original. He just helps them get into Omashu and then Katara meets him as Jet later on. So they never actually meet Jet and the Freedom Fighters. So Sokka doesn't have any of the conflict that he has with Jet. We don't get any of Sokka's instincts and none of Katara's jokes about Sokka's instincts and that whole banter in that episode, which is hilarious. But forget that, we just don't get any of Sokka in that episode. We don't get to see how intelligent intelligent he is and how intuitive he really is, we just cut all of that out. He never meets him, so we don't feel any of the betrayal either. Like when Katara finds out about his betrayal and everything, she's not even really betrayed because she doesn't know him. They changed the plot completely. He's not trying to break this dam and flood that Fire Nation town or anything. He's trying to bomb Omashu, which is Crazy, first of all. We have no understanding really of who Jet and the Freedom Fighters are because they didn't write it in, which again is why I'd rather them just cut it. If you're not gonna do it well, just don't even do it. There's also like none of Katara flirting with Jet and being so smitten with him. Jet's actually the one who's more into her and she's just kind of like a shy little girl, which is the opposite of who Katara is as a person. And then they have Jet basically have her go through like a guided meditation because she's like, I feel like my bending is blocked because I keep thinking, about what happened to my mother and I can't get over it. I think it's been affecting my bending. What do you remember when you think of your mother? I remember her. She would stop when the sun rose. Remember that. Remember the sunrise. And they have this super cheesy, cheesy scene of like her mom just like turning over her shoulder and like we see her face and it's just, oh, it's so cringy. But basically she like, goes through this guided meditation and then all of a sudden she can bend again. And it makes absolutely no sense. First of all, what Jet doesn't know anything about bending. He's not a bender. So why would he be able to help her with this at all? Why is he even helping her with anything? He doesn't do that in the original. And then after he betrays her, even though he doesn't, he says something like, I made you or whatever. Look at the power you have. That's because of me. That wasn't you. That was me. Honestly, I can't even give her that. No, he did genuinely help you get over your block in bending. He actually did something to help you. You have to give him some credit. So again, we are taking away Katara's agency because that none of that happens in the original. We're taking away Katara's agency, her getting over her own blocks, her working through her own things on her own 
which is what she does in the original show, and actually adding in elements where some man helps her out with something. And then they pretend that he didn't do that, even though he literally did. None of her bending, none of her working through any of her trauma, any of her past or anything is earned. None of it is earned, they just say it happens and then we just move on, which is something we'll get into later because they really do that later on. The only thing in this episode that like didn't make me want to scream basically was um, the look of Omashu from a distance. It looked good. And then we did include the Cabbage Man. So props to that, but that's really the only thing I can compliment. It'll be okay. There's nothing to be afraid of in there. Right. Okay, then we get into episode four. <sighs> Oh my god. <laughs> so the first thing I wrote in this was that we combined the plot of Cave of Two Lovers, Teo and his dad, Aang being imprisoned in Omashu by Bumi, Jet and the Freedom Fires, and Iroh being kidnapped all in one episode. All of that, apart from some of the Freedom Fighters stuff, is all in this one episode, episode four. All of it. Why are we combining five plots into one, one of which is not even from this season. The Cave of Two Lovers is in book two. Why are we introducing a season two plot into book one when we're not even covering everything that's in book one? I don't understand. And then I'm like, why does it feel so rushed? Maybe because it is. And we're cramming everything into one for no reason. I wrote, uh, why is Iroh talking to Aang again? Because there are so many moments in this show where Aang and Iroh just like have a conversation that makes absolutely no sense because they don't even speak to each other at this point. They've never met. Every single one of those instances is just because they need Iroh to give us some like expository dialogue. Like he just needs to explain some lore to us. Lore we've already heard by the way, because this show is also so repetitive in the writing. They just keep repeating the same thing. It's like Aang is the avatar, the last airbender because all of the air nomads were um, killed by the evil Fire Nation who did all of these evil things because they wanted to kill all of the air nomads because they wanted to kill the last airbender who is Aang the Avatar. That's what the, the dialogue of this show sounds like, like verbatim. This is the episode where we're introduced to Boomy and oh dear god, <laughs> this was some of the worst of the show. I think some of the worst moments of the show were in this episode. Why does Boomy look like that? Why does he look like this? What is this? Who decided on this? Who did the makeup for this? Why is he a younger actor in old person makeup? Why didn't you just hire somebody, an actor who was older? I think it's because he's supposed to be like buff and like a fighter and they wanted a young person's body on him for some reason. You didn't have to do that. We didn't need any of it. He can still be strong and not look buff. It's fine. Why does he look terrifying? I'm so afraid of this. The worst part of this episode was the fact that they are having Boomy just yell at Aang. He literally gives him a whole lecture about how he abandoned everyone and how he's a coward and how your friends are never gonna be there for you. You dare tell me I should care? Have you watched your whole world burn down around you? You may be a hundred years old, but you haven't lived for a hundred years. And the reason he duels him is because he's upset with him. Not because he's trying to get Aang to remember who he is, because Aang realizes who he is the first minute he sees him. So what's the point of any of the trials? There, there's none, there's no reason, none at all. And they just duel because this ancient man is mad at this 12 year old boy. You were the avatar and you left us in this world. You can't rely on anyone. Even your friends. Boomy would never, well, he would never say any of the things that he says in this show. It makes no sense. None at all. This is also where we introduce the Cave of Two Lovers plot for no reason. So many things to say about this. First of all, Aang and Katara don't go through the cave together. It's Sokka and Katara. Interesting choice there. And here is where I had a very serious question. Because at this point, we're introduced to the Badger Moles, right? And if we remember from book two of the show, the Badger Moles are the original earthbenders. Toph learns how to earthbend from the Badger Moles because they are able to sense vibrations and sounds, and that's how they're able to earthbend since they're blind and she learns from them. And that's how she's able to develop this different style of earthbending from your average earthbender. It's also how she's able to become a metal bender because she thinks about bending differently. And it's such an essential part of her character and her lore, okay? In this version of the show, they tell you that the badger moles actually sense feelings and emotions. Love is brightest in the dark. 
It wasn't about the crystals. That's not what guided Oma and Shu through the mountain. They don't navigate by sight, but by feeling. They sense feelings and react to them. I don't know if that's what makes them bend specifically, but they're able to sense feelings and emotions, which is why they don't attack Katara and Sokka while they're in the cave, which makes no sense. But if we're going based off of what they're they're saying with this, which I think this is what they're doing because I don't think they thought about this critically enough. That means that they don't sense things based on vibrations in the ground. They sense things literally based on emotion. So then how is Toph gonna learn how to bend? Explain that to me. Is she going to sense people's feelings and emotions too? Is that how she's gonna learn bending? These are the things that like, why would you change that? What was the reason? It literally completely negates and changes like a very essential plot point later on in the show. This is what I mean when I say I feel like they didn't watch the original. Not at all. This is also the episode where Iroh is like completely unapologetic towards that one Earth Nation soldier when he's been kidnapped and he's calling him out for being a war criminal as you should, because Iroh is a war criminal, and for the atrocities then, and crimes that he committed in Ba Sing Se. He was on watch the night you torched the Eastern Wall. By the time we put the fires out, there was nothing left of him to bury. All those lives lost, was it worth it? Iroh is so unapologetic in that moment. War pushes us to the edge. Some of us don't like what we find there. Is that your pitiful way of saying you're sorry for what you did? I wasn't talking about me. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Iroh? Iroh? That you think this is Iroh? I was so angry watching that scene. I can't imagine original Iroh ever doing anything like what he does in that scene specifically. I was so pissed off. Everyone was crying over Leaves on the Vine playing uh, in that one scene of Iroh's son's funeral and him talking to Zuko in that moment. I feel like people really liked a lot of the Zuko Iroh elements that they added. I hated all of them. I'm so, I'm not even sorry. I, they were bad, they were bad. They didn't add anything. I felt so much more watching the original show even if we see less. Sometimes you really just need to say less. Say less, show me things, don't tell me, and all this show does is tell. All it does is tell, and it feels so hollow. It feels so meaningless. I didn't care. Like I said, did enjoy the soundtrack. I'm glad we got to hear Leaves on the Vine. I just feel like it's too early to introduce that backstory and that element to the show because we don't learn that until book two. But again, for some reason, we're just adding in book two elements into book one and not covering half of what's in book one. Yeah, and then the end of this episode is basically Boomy once again lecturing Aang on his responsibility and how all he wants to do is goof off, even though Aang hasn't goofed off one once in this entire show so far. They just keep telling you that he does, but he never does. Ah, oh, of course. It's my old friend, the Avatar. Okay, then we get into episode five, Spirited Away. This is when we get into some more of the Zuko, um, Ozai, and Azula dynamic that they just fundamentally can't grasp. They can't grasp a woman being complex, being a little evil, like let her be her evil little self, okay? Everyone likes Azula because Azula is interesting. This Azula is boring because you gave her no flaws. She needs flaws and she's definitely one of the most flawed characters in the entire show. She's allowed to be a villain. Let her be a villain. Why are you trying to make her a hero in this story? It drives me crazy. We can still like her without excusing her actions. So this is when we enter the spirit world and in this version, this is like in the original version, the Hey Bai episode where um, Aang enters the spirit world as you can sense the theme here, they just fuck it all up. Sokka, Katara, and Aang all enter the spirit world. Makes no sense. Keep in mind, we're in episode five. We still haven't spoken to Roku. This is the first time we'll talk to Roku. Either this one or the next episode. Don't remember. But no Roku up until this point. They all enter the spirit world. They basically get trapped in the spirit world because Ko ends up keeping Sokka and Katara prisoner because this Ko doesn't just steal people's faces. He's kind of like the spider creature from Lord of the Rings who puts people in like his little web and then just keeps them there until he's hungry and then feeds on them whenever he feels like it. That's what this Ko does. So he doesn't just steal your face if you show an emotion, which was the terrifying thing about Ko. And honestly, I feel like they changed it midway through filming because when Aang first meets Ko, he's like not showing it any emotion, but nobody's told him that you can't show Ko emotion. I do. I know you. I should say so. One of your previous incarnations tried to slay me. Why would I 
try to kill you. I think they'd originally done that in the show, like in the script, and then partway through decided to change it, but they kept that scene. So Aang is just kind of standing there and expressionless, and it doesn't make sense narratively for the rest of it, but whatever. Anyway, so Ko doesn't just steal your face if you show an emotion. He holds you there until he feels like stealing your face. So that's what happens. Aang enters the spirit world. He ends up seeing Monk Gyatso in the spirit world, talks to him for a little bit, then realizes the way that he can free Sokka and Katara from Ko is by giving Ko something that was stolen from him, which in this version, for some reason, Roku stole a totem from Ko. Aang just goes to the Fire Nation temple, Roku's temple. He goes there. Nothing about the solstice, none of, none of that is happening. He, he just goes. I, I don't know how he gets into the Fire Nation, but he does. He just goes there. He talks to Roku and then he's like, Roku, what did you take from him? And then he's like, this totem. And then Aang goes back and then frees Katara and Sokka. That's what happens. Other things that happen in the spirit world that absolutely drove me nuts. First of all, Wan Shi Tong is there for some reason. Don't know, again, why are we introducing season two plots into book one? Then, you know the like little foxes that are in the library, in Wan Shi Tong's library? One of the foxes is just there and starts talking to Sokka. Even though five seconds ago, Wan Shi Tong was talking to Aang and saying that like they can't hear him speaking because this is the spirit world and only Aang can. But for some reason, this, this fox can talk to Sokka. Sure, we'll ignore that continuity error. And he's just talking to this fox all of a sudden and then the fox disappears. And then you're like, what? What was that for? And don't worry, it'll come back later unfortunately. I wrote down another note about how this show um, suffers from a terrible case of telling and not showing. I wrote down this quote, um, it's pain, that's what pain does to you, it turns you into something you're not. Instead of Aang just seeing Heibai and slowly realizing who he actually is, that he is that spirit um, and not just some monster, and the audience discovering that along with him, they just tell you that he's become a monster because he was angry. Why? Because they don't trust the audience to put it together themselves a major sign of lazy and poor writing. Again, that's just the whole show. In this episode, we basically get Katara's Southern Raiders backstory. Um, so we see like everything that happened with her mom in this version. She knows that her mom said that she um, was the waterbender and that's why the Fire Nation killed her. So we get all of that now instead of earning that from the previous two seasons and finally getting that in season three. We just get all of that information dumped on us all at once again lazy writing. And yeah, that's basically this episode. I think some of what I mentioned about Aang going to see Roku bleeds into episode six. So I think he sees uh, Roku maybe in episode six. It's all kind of blurred together. I watched it all in one night because I knew that if I did not watch it all at once, I would never finish it. Then we move on to episode six. This is where we get Zuko's backstory finally, which I haven't talked much about Zuko. And to be honest with you, I just don't have much to say. He's boring. Zuko is my favorite fictional character of all time, and he is so boring. The fact that they made me dislike some of my absolute favorite fictional characters ever, ever, is, it's a, a feat of its own. I, props to you, because I genuinely couldn't care less about 90% of, actually no, 100% of these people. <laughs> they were such boring characters. If I'd never seen the original show and I just watched this, I wouldn't have cared about anybody. So for this episode, I wrote, apart from the fact that we watch uh, people get burned alive in this adaptation, it feels 10 times more immature thematically than the cartoon ever did, because it just, it really does. Again, like I said, it feels like it talks down to the audience all the time, whereas the original, it's timeless and you can watch it at any age because it was well thought out and well written and it trusts its audience to understand its message. So the one thing I would actually change from the original Avatar series if I were to ever remake it is Iroh being creepy towards June. And I think most people agree, nobody likes that. So what they decided to do instead of making Iroh be creepy towards June is to just have June flirt with Iroh instead. I'll let it pass because your dad's kind of cute. I trust you. You know why? Because if there's any missing, you'll come after us. Because you're so cute. Because if she's doing it and she's in control, then it's feminist. <laughs> I wanted to throw up. It was horrible. <laughs> you could have just taken it all out. You easily could have just taken it all out. It was so ridiculous. I hated it. And I feel so bad for Arden Cho because like she is actually a pretty good actor, but she was given nothing in this script and I feel so bad for her. <laughs> this is also where Zhao makes his horrible speech at the prison. In the original, it's like a really powerful moment. You realize like who the Fire Nation really is and that this is like a dictatorship, that this is like an imperial power. This version felt like a frat bro talking to a whole group of other frat bros. It was horrible. We have captured 
the Avatar! Tonight, we will celebrate! We will praise the glory of the Fire Nation! The delivery of the lines was genuinely comical. I couldn't take it seriously for a second. Yeah, I wanted to tear my hair out. It was horrendous. I did write down that Zuko as the blue spirit breaking Aang out of the prison was probably the best scene in the entire show, but that's mostly because it was almost shot for shot the same as the original. So visually it looked okay. And also cause like no one was talking. I think it's better when nobody's talking. The next thing I wrote down is that I think Zuko talks too much. My biggest problem with him as a character, I think is that they make him talk about his feelings a little too much. Zuko is just angry. He's not talking about his feelings, especially this early on. He's not dealing with any of that yet. He just felt more whiny than he did angry. Actually, Azula felt more like Zuko's character to me than she did like Azula or that Zuko felt like Zuko. She kind of had like the anger and the rage and that determination that Zuko has. And she was nothing like herself at all. And Zuko just felt irritating. This was the episode where we got what was definitely like my absolute final straw. I saw in terms of the acting specifically, I saw this and I was like, oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> It's bad. <laughs> so the scene where we have Ozai and Zuko's Agni Kai, first of all, what really pissed me off about this is that Zuko fights back. Why is Zuko fighting back? The whole reason he gets banished is because he refuses to fight his father. That's where the shame comes from. The fact that he's refusing to fight his father, he loses his honor in that way and that's what it is. But he, he refuses, he doesn't wanna hurt him. That gives us so much insight into who Zuko is as a person, but we get none of that. He literally does fight his father back. So even if he's not putting as much effort into it, he still does it and that's, literally negating the point. And then they decided to like add in Ozai seeming to feel a little bit guilty for what he was doing to Zuko. I don't know if that's exactly how they wanted us to read it. I really don't know what they're doing to be honest 90% of the time, but it was just, it wasn't right. And then we get Iroh's reaction to Zuko's face getting burned. And my God, I lost my mind. <laughs> Tell me how this feels like the proper reaction to watching your nephew's face get burned compared to the original? Are, are you kidding? Why would you, why would you play it that way? I, <laughs> if that doesn't give you a clear sign of how bad the acting in this show is, I don't know what will. That's probably the worst moment. I literally had to pause it and like take a lap around my living room because I was losing my mind. It's horrible. It's just, oh, it's so, so bad. And Iroh too is such a beloved character. He's one of the most important and one of the most well-liked characters in the entire show. He felt to me like a caricature of his own character, whereas some of the other characters felt too serious for who they're supposed to be. He felt like a caricature of Iroh, which was so odd. Then we have the, the cringy scene after um, Zuko breaks Aang out of the prison. Instead of just doing the original scene after he wakes up, after Aang saves his life, where he's like, do you think we'd be friends too? They have that scene as well. However, they have Zuko wake up a first time and then Aang is just sitting there and he's like, what kind of bristles do you use in your brushes? Uh, goat hair or rabbit hair? I don't remember which one it is. And then they have like this, this weird like bonding conversation over brushes for calligraphy. I think this was in lieu of the Northern Water Tribe scene where he kidnaps Aang and then talks to him a little bit. I think that's what they were doing, but it, it wasn't even the same and it was really bad. Then he knocks uh, Zuko out again and then Zuko wakes up and then we have the original Zuko waking up scene. I don't know why we had both of those scenes, unnecessary and a waste of time. But sure, I guess. And then we just apparently end this episode with um, Iroh giving some like monologue at the end of the episode that I wrote was horrible and meaningless. I don't even remember what he said because again, meaningless. Nothing about this is gonna stick. That's the whole thing about this, right? Like the original show has withstood the test of time. It's stuck in everybody's minds. All these years later, it still holds up. This is the type of thing you watch once and you'll never think about it again because there's nothing to think about, which is so deeply ironic when you're adapting it from content that is the opposite of that, something that people have been talking about for decades at this point. Nobody cares about this version and no one will. It will not hold up because it says nothing. The plan is to go in and capture the Avatar once and for all. The plan is to reclaim what's rightfully mine. So no plan. Now we get to episode seven, The North. We're gonna go through things a little bit more quickly. These two I have less notes on, but this is where some things get like, oh my God atrociously bad as if they haven't been already. So first we have Paku. This is when we get into the wigs, the horrible, horrible wigs. Okay, first off, we have Paku. Tell me why he looks like this. What is this? Who did this wig? 
What was the reason? What crime did this man commit? Who hated him so much that they put him in this wig? It's bad. I need to know what the wig budget was because it, it seems like it was like 10 cents. Then we of course have Yue's horrible wig. Again, why is the movie version better? Why is Yue a bender? Why did we add that element in? Why can she waterbend? Part of the reason that Sokka was able to connect with her is that she's also not a bender and she feels like she has to do the most she can for her tribe, but that's something that she can't do. Okay, so like there's, there's a reason she wasn't. So why did we add that in? Also back on the topic of sexism, why did we put Yue in the kitchen? What was the thinking there? Who was subconsciously or consciously making that decision? I just wanna talk. This is when we find out that that fox that Sokka was talking to in the spirit world is actually Yue. Because Yue is part spirit, and not just because she has the moon spirit like in her, you know, from when she was born, but because she can turn into other spirits and enter the spirit world. I have a feeling this might maybe be something from the comics, the parts of the comics I haven't read yet. Even if it is, I don't like a lot of things about the comics. I don't consider a lot of what's in them to be canon, to be honest with you. And I don't like that. Even if it's in the comics, I don't care. Like you just shouldn't have added it in. There's no reason for her to be this weird fox. It made no sense. Then we get into Katara learning waterbending from Master Paku. Or should I say Katara never learning waterbending from Master Paku. Or Aang never learning waterbending from Master Paku. Because neither Aang nor Katara ever learn to waterbend. They never have a master. They never have a teacher. Instead of having Paku tell Katara that he won't teach her because she's a girl, they make the women in the healing hut tell Katara that he won't teach her because she's a girl. So we're gonna put it on the women, first of all. Then when she does confront him, he's like, no, I won't teach you because you're a girl. Then she doesn't even get angry at him the way she does in the original where she yells at him and then she's like, I'll be outside and you can come and fight me if you're man enough to do it. None of that. None of that. None of her breaking the ice on the ground because she's pissed off. She has no rage. She has no anger in her. She actually has nothing in her whatsoever because they stripped her of every single like last drop of character and moral strength that she had. She has nothing. So none of that happens. She just talks to Sokka and she's like, it's just wrong that he won't teach me. And he's like, well, you should do something about it. And she's like, okay, I'm gonna fight him. Then she fights him in a horribly cheesy scene. Again, he still refuses. This time we're not even fighting about him teaching her. We're fighting about letting her fight in the battle against the Fire Nation that's coming. And then the way that she convinces him to let her fight is that she gets all of the women from the healing hut to come up forward to and be like, we all wanna fight. So then they all fight. And then they just tell her that she is a master. Yes, yes, Katara never once learns waterbending from anyone except for the scroll, which in this version there's no pirates, so she doesn't even steal the waterbending scroll, so we don't even see the desperation she has to learn waterbending. Uh, Gran Gran just had the scroll, put it in her bag before she left the Southern Water Tribe, and she's just been practicing with this one single scroll the entire time, and they just tell her she's a master. Completely unearned. Absolutely does nothing for it. They just tell her she is. That's it. That's what happens. And then, probably the most egregious crime this entire show commits, even if we ignore absolutely everything else, in book one, Water, in which the Avatar has to learn water bending, Aang never water bends one time. Not once. He doesn't water bend at all in this entire season. He never learns, he never even tries, none of it happens no water bending to be seen. Explain that to me. And people wanna defend this, say that it's well written. He doesn't even water bend. The whole point of the season is that he's supposed to learn how to water bend. Instead, Kyoshi's like, here's a vision. <sighs> Go to the Northern Water Tribe because it's going to be destroyed. Not to learn water bending because he has to master all four elements to become the avatar and save the world. No, no, just go save the water tribe with the powers you don't have and the strength you don't have and the skills you haven't learned and we haven't been developing over this entire season because things have just been happening and we haven't been doing anything. It's insanity to me. Insanity that this is, this is what they did with the show. I noted that Katara never has a single emotional outburst. That is true, not once does she have an emotional outburst at all, even though in the original show, she's constantly getting like angry or like enraged over things because she's a really strong person who has really strong beliefs and morals and really wants to fight for what's right, what she believes is right. She just never does that because she has 
no morals, and she doesn't stand for anything, and she doesn't care about anything. She's just going along for the ride. Another thing about this that really pissed me off, they made Yue break off her engagement before her and Sokka had like a relationship because again, nobody can have a flaw. I think they didn't want anyone to be like, oh, but they're cheating, so that's wrong. And so instead of that, they make her break off her engagement beforehand, so it's okay that her and Sokka kiss. Because again, no one can be flawed. Because what? They're bad at writing. Then we move on to the final episode. I think I've covered most of it. Oh, this is when we finally get a yip yip. Sokka says yip yip, but not the iconic yip yip. He just says yip yip once and we haven't heard it this whole time. Yes, this is when they tell Katara that she just is a master, completely unearned. She hasn't learned a single thing and she just suddenly has this skill out of absolutely nowhere, hasn't trained at all. I noted that I think they really just did put all of their money into the VFX because there's nothing else going on in any of this. The thing about this episode that specifically really pissed me off was the scene where Jack dies in the original Zuko and him are fighting right and then Zhao falls off he's like hanging off of the bridge or wherever they are and Zuko tries to save him he's like take my hand like I'll help you and then Zhao is so stubborn and so arrogant that he refuses and he falls into the water and he dies it's his own arrogance that kills him and in this version he and Zuko are fighting he's going to attack Zuko Iroh kills him <laughs> And that's it. So again, we have no understanding of who Zuko is. He doesn't offer to save his life. Even though he's been trying to kill Zuko this entire time, Zuko still offers to save his life because that's who Zuko is. We don't understand Zhao, that his arrogance is what leads to his demise, taking away all the good writing from the original. And then we just have Iroh kill him. For what reason? For what reason? Anyway, I'm exhausted. <laughs> that pretty much sums it up for all of my thoughts on the new Avatar The Last Airbender live action adaptation on Netflix. Um, as you can see, I did not like it. Again, I will reiterate, it's not as bad as the movie, but again, why is the bar so goddamn low? Raise the bar, have standards. I am begging people to have standards. If we had better standards, we wouldn't be getting TV shows like this. Things like this wouldn't be allowed to be made if we were actually criticizing shit writing as we should be because if we didn't we would have never gotten a show like the original avatar the last airbender people are always like don't be so mean it's like not that bad it's bad this is objectively poorly written it, objectively really bad writing it's not like we have to have this we don't have to this doesn't have to be our baseline i am begging people to have standards <laughs> don't accept mediocrity just for the sake of being nice this is not about being nice we deserve quality television we deserve quality content to be put out this is not quality Quality. It's mediocre at best and we can do so much better than this. Anyway, that sums it up for all of my thoughts on this adaptation. I am exhausted. It's been like two, almost two and a half hours of me filming. I do not ever want to talk about this show again. I am so done with it. It's going into the locked vault with the movie for me of adaptations. I do not acknowledge um, that they even exist. So I will be going back and rewatching the original. If you've seen it, let me know any of your thoughts on it, what you thought of the changes that they made, what you liked or disliked, um, if you hated it as much as I do, or if you enjoyed it a little bit more. I'd love to hear any of your thoughts. I'm sure there are things I missed too but these were just like the notes I took down as I watched it and what I was thinking about over the past like few days. If you'd like to follow me on any of my social media to keep up with what else I'm watching or what else I'm reading all my links are in the description box as always but thank you all so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you in my next video. Bye!